Welcome back, everyone. I am fresh off of my trip home from Europe. Uh, it was an adventure, and I'll tell you more about it when we do a live stream talking about the trip. Uh, you will notice the battle scars that I have. Uh, that happened. That was caused on Omaha Beach. Yes, those are my Omaha Beach battle scars from, well, it would have been two days before D-Day, but that was my drone. But that story will come. We'll do a stream in a couple of days talking about the trip. Uh, but today, I actually want to dive into some history that I learned on the trip to Europe. Took my daughter with me this time. We were in uh, France and went to a lot of different places, but we spent a couple of days in Paris and we got to go on the Eiffel Tower and I learned some things I did not know. For example, did you know that Eiffel did not design the Eiffel Tower? It's named after Gustave Eiffel. It was meant from his company, but it was not him who designed the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and there's names actually inscribed on the side of the Eiffel Tower. And those are some of the people that were involved in designing and building it. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into all of that. Did you also know that it was red when they first built it? That's what color they painted it. They had this cool sign where it showed you the colors it's been over the years. It's not always looked like it does today. So just a couple of things we learned. We got to go up to the second level. We actually had tickets for the summit, but the summit was closed. I don't know if it's because of the weather or what, but uh, today we're going to dive into, uh, this is Geographics. I think this is the first time we've done a reaction to one of the that channel's videos. Link is in the description, as always, if you want to check out that or any of their content without my commentary. Let's go ahead and see what they have to say about the Eiffel Tower, Europe's greatest landmark. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles. And right now, for a limited time, you guys can get 25% off the cost of a subscription. More on that in just a bit. What's the first thing that pops into your head when you hear the word Paris? For roughly 90% of you, the answer isn't Notre Dame or the Seine or people who inexplicably think the beret is an acceptable fashion choice. No, it no, and you know what? I saw like three berets our entire two days in Paris. And I'll have a lot to say about our experience in Paris and I'll throw it in when I can. But yeah, it's fascinating to see Eiffel Tower because when it was built, Parisians hated it. Instead, your mind almost certainly went to a 132-year-old iron spike, a feat of 19th century engineering that still stands guard over the French capital skyline, oh, it's enormous. the Eiffel Tower. By some measures, the most visited tourist destination on Earth, the Eiffel Tower today is synonymous with everything we think about France. It's elegant, charming, timeless. Yet people didn't always see it this way. Not so long ago, it was perhaps the most hated landmark in existence. Mm -hmm. Erected in 1889 by millionaire Gustave Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower was controversial from the get-go. Outraged Parisians compared it to everything from a smokestack to a suppository. Yeah, but think about it. The thing was red, okay? It was this big metal red thing at a time when I think the tallest structure in the world was still the was it the Lincoln Cathedral? Might be St. Paul's by this point. Uh, but it was by far the tallest thing that wasn't a pyramid and wasn't a church. And, and it was red. It was... Even after its success at the World's Fair, it was earmarked for demolition. Yet somehow, it survived protests, war, and Adolf Hitler to become one of the world's most enduring icons. <laughs> For 19th century French dudes, 1889 was a hell of a significant year. Exactly a century earlier, an angry Parisian mob had stormed the Bastille, effectively kicking off the French Revolution. From this moment, it sprung the abolition of the monarchy, the birth of the French Republic, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and all the other things that Francophiles get dizzy just thinking about. So it should have been a natural decision to somehow mark this momentous occasion. But note the key word there should. In the hundred years since 1789, events had shown that the memory of the revolution was still wildly unsettled. Well, and you gotta, and I'm sure he's going to talk about this, but you have to understand, it's not like here in the United States, there was the Revolutionary War. You have that little bit of time where you have the Articles of Confederation, then you go right to the Constitution. But from 1789 on, We've been under the same system of government. We've changed presidents because of elections, but it's been stable all the way through. It wasn't that way in France. France went back and forth from monarchy to republic to uh, different kinds of monarchies to, uh, you know, to getting 
beaten in the Franco-Prussian War, and uh, anything but stability has marked the 19th century for the French. There had been Napoleon's empire, which crushed the First Republic, the restoration of the monarchy, the birth and death of the short-lived Second Republic, the Second Empire reigned over by Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III. Even when the current government, the Third Republic, had finally arrived on the scene in 1870, it had been forced to fight the revolutionary Paris Commune for control, a bloody battle that... And that was in the aftermath of the, um, you know, so 1870, you've got the Franco-Prussian War, you have the overthrow of that empire, and then you have the Paris Commune being set up. That's a story in and of itself. But uh, yeah, we're not even two decades on from some pretty massive upheaval, upheaval in France. So not everybody's all on board with remembering the revolution. To killed thousands. In short, 1880s France was a tinderbox of monarchists, republicans, bonapartists, and communards, all of whom saw... And that looks like, uh, that looks like it's probably the obelisk. Uh, I believe that was brought there. It was actually a gift from Egypt uh, to France. And uh, I think it was like the 1830s that, that was placed there. Uh, and it marks the spot where... Um, Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, Maximilien Robespierre, and some others were guillotined. Great spot to stand because from where you're standing, you can at one place look straight ahead and see the uh, Eiffel Tower way off in the distance. You look a little to your right and you see the Arc de Triomphe right down the street, the Champs Elysees. Uh, you can look over to your left and see the Museum of the Army, um, uh, Hotel des Invalides, and you've got right behind that the church where Napoleon and Marshal Foch and others are buried. It's a really cool spot. Box of monarchists, republicans, bonapartists, and communards, all of whom saw the 1789 revolution very differently. On top of that, a stock market crash in 1882 had left the country in a deep depression. Whatever celebration took place would have to be both as uncontroversial as possible and extremely cheap. As 1889 Neither of which the Eiffel of the Tower Republic was. started toying with the idea of marking the centenary with an exposition universelle. What we these were really popular, especially in the 19th century. These world fairs, these expositions. You had a big one in London uh, that was set up by um, Queen Victoria's husband, uh, Prince Albert. Um, you have one that happens in New York, or in, uh, in um, well, there was one in New York. I think in the 19, in the 1900s, but uh, you had one in Chicago, and you usually have these big, you know, the Pan, Amer Pan American Exposition in 1901 in Buffalo, where William McKinley is assassinated. There's all these incredible like displays and and um, places to go and see the latest in science and technology. So this is just one of those. It was a really popular thing at that time. We'd call a World's Fair. The last one they'd thrown in the 1870s had been well attended, but had lost the treasury over 30 million francs. Mm. On the other hand, when Napoleon III held one under the Second French Empire, it turned a tidy profit. Clearly, it was possible to make money off of these things, and an exposition would also be less provocative than simply, say, singing La Marseillaise while dancing round a guillotine. I think it's La Marseillaise is how it's pronounced, but... But it would still have to be big. A big exposition with a big centerpiece. One that acknowledged the Third Republic's debt to 1789 without encouraging the unwashed masses to start chopping off people's heads again. It would be from these twin necessities that Paris's greatest landmark would be born. On November the 8th, 1884, President Jules Grévy announced that Paris would host its fourth Exposition Universelle from May 1889. Alongside that, it was announced that the capital would commission a 300-meter tower to stand alongside the Seine. But rather than design the tower themselves, the government was throwing it open to a competition. The news that any idiot could design Paris's newest landmark hit architecture circles like a bomb. 300 meters is still pretty massive, but at the time it was nearly double the height of the then tallest man-made structure, the Washington Monument. Yeah, I forgot about the Washington Monument. Washington Monument was begun well before the American Civil War. And if you go there today, you notice a distinct change in color of the Washington Monument about a third of the way up because that's about how far they got before the American Civil War. The project was abandoned for a while and then they finally came back to finish it up uh, after the American Civil War. And uh, I think the stones they got were from a different quarry or a different part of the quarry or whatever it was, they're a different color and that's why you see that. So yeah, 555 feet at this point, that's a good 100 or so feet taller than the pyramids, taller than any of the other churches that have been built at this point. But still, all steel, 
Uh, this is an incredible feat of engineering. Whoever designed the new tower would become instantly famous, their building as iconic as the Burj Khalifa is today. Naturally, this attracted all sorts of crackpots. Over the months of the competition, designs were submitted for everything from a 300-meter watering can to, appropriately, a gigantic guillotine. Amid all of this madness, one design stood out. Jules Bordet was perhaps Paris's leading proponent of all that was traditional, baroque, and beautiful. His proposal would be a stone tower of Babel, reaching into the heavens and topped with a beacon so powerful that people across the city would be able to read by its light after sunset. It was a grand vision, everything the Third Republic's government could have wanted in their new landmark. But Bordet's tower wasn't the only proposal in town. Out there, amidst the city's cobbled lanes and sweeping boulevards, another visionary was preparing his own design, one so dramatic it would give Jules Bordet a heart attack. And it's interesting, too, because one of the things that we learned when we were in Paris is, you know, I mentioned this in the video about comparing Paris and London. I didn't fully understand it as much as I do now after having been there. Uh, they do have a law in place now that I think buildings can't be taller than six stories high. Uh, that law wasn't always in place. And so if you're at the Eiffel Tower, you can see that just kind of off in the distance, there is a pretty tall building and there's a little section of tall buildings. But for the most part, Paris is pretty flat, comparatively speaking, compared to the Eiffel Tower. And it's very traditional in terms of the structures and things like that. And uh, it's actually pretty neat. And there's a kind of a, a method to the madness of those structures. And I forget the name of the houses that they're called, but they have a very particular name and design. Uh, Parisians are all about that very traditional design. The visionary's name was Gustave Eiffel, and he was about to put forward a plan that would transform Paris. It wasn't his plan, though. I think it was people in his, in his company that designed it. If Jules Bordet was French architecture at its most classical and conservative, Gustave Eiffel was the living embodiment of the new age. Born in Dijon on December 15, 1832, Eiffel had begun working with Metal at university, graduating with a determination to embrace the industrial style. Beginning in 1858, he had made a killing building bridges, starting with the Passerelle Eiffel in Bordeaux and reaching his pinnacle with Portugal's Ponte Maria Pier. A yeah, we learned a little bit about this on our tour of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, uh, yeah, he was he was already very well known by the time that the Eiffel Tower comes about. It, he was a it, at least in architecture circles a, a household name. Uh, he did not become famous because of this tower, but it, because he had already made such a living, he was able to finance the tower project, which is what helped get it make it possible is that he put up a lot of the money himself to make it happen. Bridge that bears more than a passing resemblance to his famous tower. The work had turned him into a millionaire and got him commissions doing stuff like creating the internal support system yep. of the Statue of Liberty. In short, Gustave Eiffel in the 1880s was some hot shit, even if he was a bit of a weird guy in private. For example, when looking for a wife, he demanded his mother find him a good housekeeper who will not pester me too much, who will cheat on me as little as possible, and who will give me five and healthy children that will, in fact, be mine. There's nothing weird about that, though, really, is there? My apologies to all the wives out there. That doesn't sound bad. I mean, wouldn't we all Mother take that? Mother him a good housekeeper who will not pester me. Now listen, please don't interpret me to say that I think all women should be housekeepers, right? I totally support my wife works. I can't imagine a situation where she wouldn't want to work. I think she'd go nuts if she was home all the time. Uh, so I'm not trying to stay, you know, true to gender stereotypes or anything like that. I've been a stay-at-home dad for a long time, other than what I do with YouTube now. Um, but uh, this isn't a bad thing for a guy in the 19th century to want, right? Me too much, who will cheat on me as little as possible, and who will give me fine, healthy children that, that will be, in fact, fact mine. Be mine. French truly is the language of love, hmm? So, odd home life aside, Eiffel in 1884 was one of Paris's most respected designers. So when news of the tower competition broke, his assistants got on it right away. Yes, assistants. Despite giving his name to it, Gustave Eiffel wasn't the actual designer of the right. Eiffel Tower. And if you'd <laughs> asked me that a week and a half ago, I would not have known that. I think a lot of people just assume he designed it and built it, because it's got his name on it. That's why... They've got all the other names written on the side of it now. What? 
Rather, it was Maurice Cushon, Emile Nugier, and Stéphane Souvestre. And I should mention, they don't have everybody's name on it. They only have people's names that would fit in the sections. A lot of people's names didn't get on it. Who did all of the brainstorming and sketching. Eiffel himself merely passed on recommendations, and once they had a design to his liking, he bought the rights to the plans. Still, Eiffel was 100% behind his underling's design. The simple industrial appearance, the rejection of ornamentation. It was the antithesis of everything Jules Baudet had proposed, and that could only mean one thing, a fight. Okay, so here we are at the 1884 Heavyweight Design Championships to decide the world's tallest structure. In the red corner, we have Jules Baudet, who can build ornamental towers that people love, but who hasn't convinced the judge. I feel like, and I don't know, because I don't know exactly how this stuff works, I feel like that one's going to be a lot more expensive and probably a lot more difficult to build. Is that his 300 meter stone monster will be structurally sound. In the blue corner, we have Gustave Eiffel with a design so newfangled people are literally protesting in the streets, but with a track record of building stuff that doesn't fall down, that's a plus for him. So, who will win this clash of the titans? Well, you already know the answer. Eiffel was a master at PR. When people accused him of wanting to build something ugly, he responded that his tower's design was dictated by nature itself, its lattice surface allowing it to withstand strong winds. Right. It was an early version of the modernist credo that form follows function, and it found favor with the judges. On June the 12th, 1886, Eiffel was announced the winner, with the committee declaring the tower to be built for the 1889 Exposition Universelle must clearly have a distinctive character and should be an original masterpiece. Only Eiffel's tower satisfies these requirements fully. <laughs> and yet it's fascinating that people absolutely hated it when it was built. It was originally only supposed to stand for 20 years, and, and the only reason it was even going to stand that long is because Eiffel said he needed to make his money back or a good bit of it on his investment in order to justify the cost of building it. It was a grand victory from the former bridge builder, the vindication that the industrial work he'd devoted his life to could be as beautiful as any number of Bordet's stone designs. Unfortunately, it was only after it won that Eiffel realized that the prize came with strings attached. Unwilling to risk public money in a depression, the government would only put up a quarter of the costs of the new tower. Eiffel would have to pay for everything else out of his own pocket. In the end, Eiffel agreed on one condition, that all profits the tower turned in its projected 20-year lifespan went solely to him. Figuring this would allow Eiffel to break even, or maybe even turn a small profit, the committee agreed. This all could anyone have guessed just how insanely rich this contract would eventually make him. The idea of a gigantic iron tower dominating a city skyline wasn't exactly new in 1886. Way back in 1833, there had been attempts to make a gigantic iron monolith in England to commemorate the Parliamentary Reform Bill. More recently, two American engineers had drawn up plans to do the same for 1876 for the Philadelphia Expo. Hmm. From the way Parisians reacted, though, you'd think Gustave Eiffel had come up with the idea solely as a way of taking a gigantic dump on their city. Yep. The backlash to Eiffel's winning... And here's the thing, and this is just a very uninformed, very kind of brief view and glimpse of the French, but... It sure seems like French people just love to protest and just love to be against things, right? We were there uh, last week, and there were a bunch of protests we saw going on over, um, I think, over their desire to raise the retirement age from 62. 62? French people already live longer than the U.S. people do, and 62 is not bad, really. Uh, and I could go into all of that, but... And there's a lot of protests going on, uh, strikes and things like that. And I know they go on in other places, too. And uh, just I, I feel like the French people are kind of predisposed to be against things. I don't know. Design was swift and intense. In the districts surrounding the tower's proposed site, people protested that it might fall over and crush their houses. In Paris's fancy salons, intellectuals sharpened their knives for a fell. The author, Joris Carl Housmans, declared the design a whole riddled suppository. Maupassant branded it a high and skinny pyramid of iron ladders, while Leon Bloy called it a truly tragic street lamp. Now here's the thing. 
we can't blame these guys too much for being critical of it, right? Because in all of history, anytime somebody does something that we look back on history and say, wow, that was amazing. There were always people at the time who hated it. The Beatles got rejected by record labels, okay? That happened. J.K. Rowling was rejected by publishers with her Harry Potter series idea. Uh, there's always going to be people who just don't see how popular or how brilliant something's going to be. The son of the great writer, Alexandre Dumas, protested its construction. Meanwhile, luminaries from across Paris joined into the Committee of 300, one member for each meter of the tower's height. The committee's speciality was attacking the tower in pamphlets, and they did a great job. Check out this broadside. Even the commercial Americans would not want this Eiffel Tower, which is, without any doubt, a dishonor to Paris. Even Americans would hate this. That's how awful it is. I love it heavy stuff. Well, sadly, this is just at the more acceptable end of the spectrum. At the other end, people started attacking Eiffel with anti-Semitic slurs. Uh. A pretty remarkable thing when you consider that he wasn't even Jewish. But hey, that was just how the Third Republic rolled. It was now less than a decade until the Dreyfus Affair, and France was so rabidly anti-Semitic that people's brains basically went, I don't like this thing, therefore it must be Jewish. Stay classy, history. Deep not unique to France, unfortunately, at all. Deeply upset, Eiffel tried to fight back, saying he thought the tower would be beautiful, and asking, Are we to believe that because one is an engineer, one is not preoccupied by beauty in one's constructions, or that one does not seek to create elegance as well as solidity and durability? Hmm. But the arguments that had won over the judges barely made a dent in this wall of public opposition. Luckily, though, there was no time left for the government to change their minds. Ground was broken on January the 26th, 1887, a little over two years before the Exposition Universelle's official opening. It was an impossibly tight deadline to build a record-breaking tower, especially one that was meant to include restaurants and theaters and elevators. But he felt had a trick up his sleeve. But as far back as 1884, his workshop had registered a patent for a new way of assembling metal supports for the tower two years before he actually won the competition. My man basically made an assembly line process for building a 300 meter tower. It's really impressive stuff. Since then, his workers have been fine tuning a plan for preparing everything in the company factory to be quickly shipped and assembled in as little time as possible. When the starting gun on their great project was at last fired, they were more than ready. Over the next 26 months, over 7,300 tons of iron would be forged, shipped, and assembled in the heart of Paris. Just wrap your mind around that for a minute. This is eight, the 1880s. This is the 1880s technology. This is a time before we have all the modern stuff we have now. They built a steel tower that was over a thousand feet tall that was going to be basically double the size of the tallest structure in the world which at the time was not even made of steel was made of stone they built it somewhere else brought it to the site and assembled it and they did it in just a little more than two years and at least on paper without a single death now, there's an argument to be made that there were deaths, that they were undocumented people and things like that, but... That's the 19th century equivalent of warp speed. Yeah. It would take a workforce of up to 300 on site and another 150 at the factory, all supported by some 50 designers and engineers. When it was finally finished in record time, it would leave even Eiffel's enemies dazed with wonder. Stupid fast. 26 months. In early size. 1889, a French journalist filed a report from the Eiffel Tower construction site. A thick cloud of tar and coal smoke seized the throat, and we were deafened by the din of metal screaming beneath the hammer. With each blow came a shower of sparks. These black figures, appearing larger than life against the background of the open sky, looked as if they were reaping lightning bolts in the cloud. So they use the same kind of system, if you're familiar with the building of the Titanic, with the rivets, right? Where you bring steel together and you put the rivets into it and you have to heat the rivets and put them in and everything. And there's like something like two and a half million rivets in the Eiffel Tower. You can see them. It's really cool. In this short description, we can already see the dominant feeling the Eiffel Tower would soon elicit in everyone who saw it, or, or in the face of something so vast, so overwhelming. 
It was a feeling that the city of Paris had gotten used to over the last two years. From the moment ground was broken, almost everything about the Eiffel Tower's construction had been dizzying. The underground supporting blocks dug below the level of the Seine had required gigantic caissons for keeping the water out. The tower itself had been forged from 18,000 separate pieces, as an accuracy of a tenth of a millimeter. Mm. Joining them together were 2.5 million rivets, each of which required a team of four men to heat it, weld it, and bash it into place in a cascade of sparks. It was simply a building project beyond anything Paris had ever seen before. And listen, we live in 2023, and so I've been to New York City and seen, you know, the the nearly 1800 foot tall Freedom Tower. And, you know, I've been to Chicago and seen the Willis Tower there it used to be called Sears Tower. You've seen these incredible buildings. But man, even today to go there, you come out of the subway and you come around the corner and you look at it. It is so massive. It's incredible. Even just the wooden scaffolding and steam-powered cranes needed for the first floor were a sight to behold. When the first level was reached just before Christmas of 1887, Parisians must have been like, okay, that's big enough, you can stop now. But of course, Eiffel's project didn't stop. It kept on growing and growing, an iron skeleton rising higher and higher into the sky. Remember, this is a world in which the tallest man-made structure in existence was the Washington Monument, itself only recently completed. And now, here came Eiffel's tower, not just surpassing its height, but nearly doubling it, growing so far up into the sky that it wouldn't be exceeded for another 40 years. For the Parisians in the late 1880s, it must have felt like they were living in a And the thing that would exceed it would be the Chrysler building in the 1930s, which was then exceeded by the um, Empire State Building, which stayed the tallest building in the world for like 40 years. Modern Babel. The second floor of the tower was finished in 1888. About seven months later, in March of 1889, the third floor was reached. By April 1st that year, the New York Times was reporting that far from an eyesore, Eiffel's new structure was light and graceful and not unworthy of Paris. Even some of the anti-tower crowd were starting to admit that they'd been wrong. That, if this really was a whole riddled suppository, then it was a damn sight better than Jules Bourdais' giant stone. Hemorrhoid. In the end, the deadline was just too tight for Ifal and his workers. As the exposition threw its doors open on May the 15th, 1889, they were still frantically putting the finishing touches on their tower, working like mad to get the elevators installed. But even if the Eiffel Tower wasn't quite finished, it was finished enough for visitors. The very first day, thousands flocked to Paris's newest landmark, paying to climb the hundreds of steps to the top. For the rest of the expo, it's estimated that an average of 12,000 people visited the tower each day. Wow. There was no longer any denying it. The Eiffel Tower was a hit, a bona fide actual hit. By the time the expo closed, nearly six months later, Gustave Eiffel and his creation would be famous not just in France, not just in Europe, but across the whole damn world. So hold on, because I want to see if I can find an image of what the color looked like at the time it was built when it was painted red. So here you go. Here's what it looked like over the years. Um, 1887, 1888, it was that color. It ended up this color red for a few years. Then they painted it yellow. Then it was kind of orange, and it's gotten a little more kind of neutral since then. For the last 50 years, it was like this, and now it's actually a darker color since 2019. The 1889 Exposition Universelle lasted to October the 31st. In that time, some 32 million visitors descended on Paris, generating wow. the Third Republic a profit of 8 million francs. In other words, it was everything the organizers dreamed of. The Republicans and revolutionaries were happy the revolution centenary got a big party, while the monarchists and Bonapartists were able to just enjoy the fair itself. Even foreign nations swooned before the French celebrations. Despite Britain refusing to recognize an exposition marking a revolution, the future king Edward VII still attended. America, meanwhile, sent luminaries like Thomas Edison. But what of the Eiffel Tower itself? In the six odd months of the exposition, There's the red. it's estimated around two million people visited the Eiffel Tower on top of the millions more who simply admired it from afar. One of the biggest draws was the view from the top. With the Wright brothers over a decade away from their first flight and hot air balloons still the preserve of the rich, most Parisians had simply never seen their city from so high up before. Perhaps. That's a great point because, and, and even at the second level, because we didn't get to go all the way to the top, an amazing view. Yeah, we don't have satellites, we don't have airplanes. We live in a world today where we take for granted that we can see what things look like from the sky. 
Uh, they didn't. Nobody had seen this kind of stuff. Man, that's a big deal. Sensing this, Gustav Eiffel had an office for himself installed on the top floor. It was here, before a panoramic view of Paris, that he met with Edison. Yet it wasn't just the views that made the tower such a hit. Eiffel had covered the iron skeleton with hundreds of gas lamps, all of which lit up at night, creating a burning silhouette on the horizon. Wow. Every morning, a cannon was fired something. at the very top, announcing the opening of the exposition. On top of that, there were performances held on the tower and themed restaurants open for visitors. One of the most frequent guests was Guy de Maupassant, who famously complained that the Eiffel Tower was the only place in Paris that he could enjoy as a lunch without having to look at the damn Eiffel Tower. By the time the exposition closed, Closed its doors for the final time, Gustav Eiffel had already broken even on his investments. Wow. With the tower designed to stand for another 20 years, it seemed obvious he was going to die a very, very rich man. Unfortunately, getting to that point was going to involve taking a very tortured route. Back in 1887, with his tower only just underway, Eiffel had taken a contract to build locks for the new Panama Canal. This isn't the Panama Canal you know, the one you obviously watched our video on. Rather, it was a French attempt under Ferdinand de Lesseps that began in 1880. Unfortunately, by the time Eiffel came on board, de Lesseps had monumentally screwed up the project. Some 20,000 workers had died of tropical diseases, and the finances were on the brink of collapse. Before Eiffel could design a single lock, they did collapse. On February the 4th, 1889, just as Eiffel was finishing his tower, the French Panama Canal project imploded. So much money was lost that everyone involved was indicted on fraud charges, including Eiffel. That meant Oops. the inventor spent the entire exposition, what should have been the proudest moment of his life, waiting to be summoned by the courts. When at last the trial went ahead, Eiffel was handed a two-year prison sentence for his part in the Panama scheme. Although the sentence would be overturned on appeal, the experience left him pretty traumatized. So again, I mean, history goes a different way, and we're talking about the Eiffel Tower project as being this colossal mistake that caused people millions, right? The way you get incredible successes like the Eiffel Tower or incredible projects like the eventual Panama Canal to be completed is by being willing to take monumental risks. Now, granted, the Eiffel Tower is not a risk so much because you're talking about science, and he, I'm sure, was very confident in the science. But what if there had been an accident on the site and a hundred guys have been killed? What are we talking about? Do they continue the project? I mean, you know, th those kinds of things could happen. And there's so many times in history where we see things as failures, where if one thing goes a different way, it's a success, and we're talking about somebody as a hero instead of a villain. In the aftermath, he withdrew from the public eye, devoted his life to science experiments. It was wild. The guy in that picture looks, I mean, I'm assuming that's Eiffel, but he looks an awful lot like Robert Todd Lincoln. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so maybe not as much as I thought, but man, when I first saw that picture, that was my first thought. It's probably just the beard. I mean, the hair is definitely different. They're both about the same age in those pictures. So, yeah, I don't know. I just thought that in this semi-exile that Eiffel began to formulate a plan, a plan to save his grandest project, to ensure it lasted long after he himself had passed away. It was a plan that would ensure the Eiffel Tower remained standing to this very day. Oh, don't show that, that's copyrighted those lights. Since we've alluded to it a couple of times already, you might now be wondering something like, wait, the Eiffel Tower is only meant to stand for 20 years, how come it's still there? Well, the answer to that is a single word. Radio. As the deadline for the tower's destruction loomed, Gustave Eiffel desperately tried to prove its usefulness as a place for scientific experiments. Although we had some minor successes, such as when Theodore Wolff first observed the effects of cosmic rays there, the real breakthrough came in 1898. Then November, Eugène de Crete established radio contact between the Eiffel Tower and the Pantheon. Now, the Pantheon is only four kilometers away from the Eiffel Tower, but it was the start of something big. By 1899, the tower was capable of making radio contact with London, an increase in signal distance of almost a hundred times. Huge. Suddenly interested, the French military asked Captain Gustave Ferrier to look into these experiments for This is the start of the time period where you have radio towers and TV towers going up high and sending out broadcast signals, right? 
Big stuff. Further, if Ell himself made the tower completely available and even funded an antenna to aid the captain's work, and this was a shrewd move. By 1905, Ferrier had used the tower to establish radio contact with Tunisia. Come 1908, his transmissions Africa. were beaming out over an incredible 6,000 kilometers. Through dumb luck, if Ell had found the perfect way to save his tower from destruction by turning it into a gigantic radio transmitter. In 1909, just a few months before it was due to be torn down, the military established a permanent listening station at the Eiffel Tower. Thanks to this, the city permit for the tower was extended all the way until 1980. By the time that year rolled around, Paris without the Eiffel Tower would be as unthinkable as New York without the Statue of Liberty. But that's not to say that our story ends here, in 1909, with the tower finding a new lease of life. There's one last anecdote to tell, one more moment in history when Paris's greatest landmark came within a hair's breadth of destruction. The year was 1944, the year the Allies liberated France from the Nazi-backed Vichy regime. By now, Gustave Eiffel was long dead, carried off on December 27, 1923, at the age of 91, but his masterpiece was still as vibrant as ever. Over the previous decades, the tower had done everything from intercept transmissions that helped uncover the German oh, spy matter Harry to function as a beacon to guide Charles Lindbergh to Paris at the end of his record-breaking... Fun fact about Charles Lindbergh, did you know that his father... <laughs> the, I think his father or his grandfather actually changed the name. Their original last name was actually Manson. Yes, he should be Charles Manson. Transatlantic flight. It had become such a powerful symbol of France that Adolf Hitler had even been photographed in front of it in 1940 as a way of starkly conveying the French defeat. Now, in 1944, with an Allied victory at hand, the Eiffel Tower was again on Hitler's mind. Just before Paris was liberated, the Fuhrer issued an order to destroy the city's greatest monuments. Among them was the tower, which the Nazi leader wanted reduced to twisted scrap metal. Given the destruction Europe suffered in those years, it's easy to imagine a world where this order was carried out. Where Could you imagine if they had destroyed things like the Arc de Triomphe, the... Hotel des Invalides, where Napoleon's buried, the Eiffel Tower, some of these incredible landmarks. Oh, what a loss that would have been. The Eiffel Tower ceased to exist in the summer of 1944, but thankfully, that's not this world. The Nazi head of Paris, General Dietrich von Choltlitz, refused the Führer's Good for him. It said that he made up his mind while looking down at the Tuileries Garden and seeing the silhouette of Gustave Eiffel's tower standing in the distance. The Eiffel Tower today may be synonymous with both Paris and France as a whole, but its existence should never be taken for granted. Hmm. In many parallel universes, this iconic masterpiece no longer exists, torn down, blown up, and never to be seen in the first place. We shouldn't forget how lucky we are to live in a universe where it is still standing as Europe's greatest landmark. Good stuff. I learned some stuff there I didn't know. Hopefully you did as well. It's a fascinating story. Let's continue the conversation in the comment section below. Let me know something you learned or something else that you can add that you can share with all of us. Have you visited the Eiffel Tower? What did you think of it? Boy, the crowds were crazy. There was a lot going on. It was really crowded even up there. Tough to get at you know a place to view it, but certainly worth it for sure. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Check out the original content. See you again soon. Thanks for watching.